Okay, so uh, once again, we're going to talk about ADAR, the Disk Archiver, which is a nice tool for managing uh, multiple files and archives on a Unix uh, file system. Uh, so on clusters such as uh, Cedar, Gram, and Beluga, we have large parallel file systems, and they were designed for storing uh, large files, so large data dumps, uh, data dumps from simulations running on these clusters. So they were specifically designed for storing very large files, a small number of uh, very large files. And they can easily get overwhelmed with uh, lots of small requests if you're writing a, a little bit of data frequently or, or if you're storing a lot of small files. So uh, the best solution uh, for this problem is actually to avoid writing uh, multiple small files and to change your simulation code or your workflow in such a way that you're storing a small number of uh, very large files, then, uh, then uh, everything will be efficient. So unfortunately, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you're running somebody else's code and you cannot recompile it, you cannot change it, and you end up with a large number of small files. And having a large number of small files on a parallel file system, so file systems like Home, Scratch, and Project on Cedar, Gram, and, and Beluga, and Niagara as well, uh, can actually slow down uh, not just uh, your work, but everybody else's work. Uh, so these large parallel file systems, they are very different from a standalone hard drive or an SSD in that um, they uh, typically uh, consist of hundreds or thousands of uh, drives, and these drives are mounted by a, a parallel file system, and then there is striping to ensure efficiency, etc. And uh, when you write a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, files into, let's say, a directory, and do LS uh, in, in, inside such a file system in that directory, uh, you can actually wait for a long time for any, any output because, uh, well, that file system was just not designed for storing a large number of uh, small files. So uh, a second solution is to uh, pack all these small files into archives. And uh, the classical tool for this is TAR. So TAR has been around since uh, 1970s. Uh, we're actually marking the 40th anniversary of TAR this year. And it's uh, showing its age. It was designed not for disk storage, but for tape storage. And uh, uh, so the limitation is, the main limitation of TAR is that it cannot, it does not allow random access to its content. So each TAR file uh, packs a large number of uh, smaller files inside. And then uh, they're all written uh, sequentially. So you have blocks for each file inside of TAR. And then inside each block, you have a header that describes the, the file, so basically the name, uh, some other information, permissions, and the file size. And then you have some padding to reach a multiple of uh, 512 bytes. And then after that padding, you have uh, the file contents, right? So uh, the header, padding, and file contents, and then repeat and, and do it again for each file instead of uh, the TAR archive. So the problem here is there's no global index. That is, if you have a very large TAR file, you actually have to scan the headers of individual headers of each file inside of the TAR archive to, file, to find your small file somewhere or your large file somewhere in the middle or at the end of the TAR file. And that takes quite a while. So there are third party tools that allow you random, uh, well, that um, create a, a, an archive for a TAR file. And so I give a couple of examples here, quite popular uh, projects. One is a TAR indexer. It's actually a Python script uh, to add a, uh, a, um, an index to a TAR archive. And there is another tool which I, I, I recommend. It's pretty good, uh, RAD. So it's actually an extension uh, to TAR. It replaces the original TAR. And it creates a TAR archive with an index at the very end. So And it's cross-compatible with the old archives and vice versa. You can use the classical TAR tool to extract RAD archives. Uh, and, and it works pretty well. So another solution which I highly recommend is actually use a more modern tool than, than TAR. So there's a tool that was started about 20 years ago, so first released in 2002, and it's called DAR, stands for Disk Archiver, and it was designed from the ground up as a modern day replacement to TAR. Uh, so DAR is open source, and uh, it's actively maintained. So the latest release is, uh, happened about a month ago. And similar to TAR, it supports uh, full archiving, uh, differential and incremental backups. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these uh, later on in, in one of the demos. 
So, but unlike TAR, it actually has an index built into the DAW archive itself. So that means if you have a lot of files, if you have a large archive, then a listing its contents while searching for a file and then, uh, and then extracting a file somewhere from, let's say, the middle of the archive is actually going to happen a lot faster than with TAR. And in, in, in the very first example, I'll actually show you the timings. So I did some benchmarking. Uh, also, DAR has a, a number of other nice features. So it has a built-in compression on a file-by-file -file basis, you know, unlike TAR. So with TAR, what you do is the classical TAR. Uh, if you have a bunch of files, you can compress them individually first, and then you tie them into an archive, or you tie them into an archive, and then you compress the individual archive. So uh, with DAI, you actually have an option to do compression on the fly while you're packing files into an archive, and you can do um, um, selective uh, compression. So for example, you can exclude certain files uh, from compression, uh, let's say large already compressed files like video files or perhaps uh, uh, zip files that were compressed already. And so this gives you a benefit of a faster backup and also a benefit of a more resilient backup because if you have a, um, a, a data corruption somewhere in one of the files, it does not affect other files, uh, unlike with a zip tar archive where you have data, if you have data corruption, then the whole archive is, is toast. Uh, also, DA has built-in strong encryption, uh, can split files at one bit resolution, supports extended file attributes, uh, sparse files, hard symbolic links, works really well on pretty much any flavor of Linux and also with uh, macOS tools. Uh, so for example, things like um, uh, forks, uh, so macOS forks and uh, and sparse um, disk images uh, under macOS, so all of that is supported. So really, it's a full-featured, uh, full-featured tool. Uh, there's also a nice comparison online um, of, the of the features of TAR and DAR. It's a huge table with some like 30 or 50 different entries. And if you're interested, you can just click on that and uh, and, and see the all the benefits of, of DAR yourself. So we have DAR installed on Compute Canada clusters. It's part of the standard software, CVMFS software setup. So the system version of DAR is somewhat older, and it still works. It will, uh, it can, uh, so you can actually run all examples, today's examples in, in this presentation, using the older version of DAR that is installed on each uh, Compute Canada system. Um, uh, there is a bug there that will throw a warning, and as far as I can tell you, in, so that's the uh, version 2. 5.3 of DAR. As far as you can tell, uh, that warning is completely harmless, but if you don't like it or if you want to go to a more recent version, uh, on Cedagram and Beluga, I also compile the most recent version of DAR, and it's sitting in my home directory forward slash DAR forward slash bin and then the utility is called DAR. So if you can actually create an, an alias, so just alias the original DAR command to uh, this path, and uh, then you'll be using the uh, most recent version of uh, DAR on these clusters. And you can actually compile it from, from source as well. So all you need to do, so here is I'm showing the slide how you can compile DAR from source, just download the uh, latest release, unpack it, so untie it, uh, CD in there, and then configure it, so basically specify the prefix where you want to install it, so in this case it's going to be installed into a DAR subdirectory in, in your home directory on, on the cluster, and then disable shared libraries, so I do this uh, just to make sure that you don't have to modify your uh, library path when you want to run DAR, then you compile it, install it, and it's going to be sitting inside, so utility DAR is going to be sitting inside directory uh, DAR forward slash bin in your home folder. And then all the examples I'm going to show you today are going to work just fine with this version as well. So this slide, this is not an actual demo. The demo start in the next slide. But here I'm showing uh, the seeking time. So uh, just the benefits of uh, DAR, comparison of DAR and TAM, so some benchmarking. Uh, so here what I did um, on a laptop, so don't do this on a cluster because the whole idea is of this presentation is uh, you, should, uh, not, you should not have a lot of small files on a cluster. But in this case, I'm doing this on a standalone external hard drive on a laptop. And uh, the reason I want to do it on an external hard drive as opposed to a built-in SSD is because I want to show you the benefits of DAR. So these benefits will be multiplied by the, the fact that I have a very slow external storage. So what I'm doing here is I, oops, sorry. What I'm doing here is I went and created a temporary test directory, and into this directory, I wrote a thousand files. So the variable uh, random in Unix gives you a random number between zero and 32,000. And then I simply use the DT utility uh, to pick up uh, entirely random bits in block sizes of uh, one kilobyte, and then um, uh, multiply them by some number. So essentially, I'm creating here a thousand completely random files. And each file size is going to vary from, be random from anywhere from one megabyte to 33 
megabytes. So I create these, uh, these thousand random files. So each file is going to be called test uh, and then uh, three digits. So from 000 to 999. And then the total uh, size of the directory is 17 gigabytes. Because it's, uh, these are random files, uh, they cannot really be compressed very efficiently. Uh, but that's besides the point. So, and then here I'm uh, just timing the two commands. So creating archives, of course, is going to be the same, roughly the same timing for both uh, tar and dar. So it took somewhere in the neighborhood of six minutes to create both a tar archive and a dar archive. So the tar archive is called all.tar and the dar archive is called all.1.dar. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through the options and why, why these file names in the next slide. So here I'm just showing the, uh, the, the timings of, for extraction. And then I type, take the 17 gigabyte tar archive and a 17 gigabyte dar archive and I extract a file somewhere in the middle. So there are, not, uh, there are a thousand files and so I'm just pick randomly a file, let's say test 596 and then I extract it. And then, so before, every time before I extract these files with both tar and dar, I make sure to clear the cache. So what I do, I unmount the hard drive and then I uh, mount it again. I uh, delete the, uh, the, uh, the uh, test file, so the file that I'm extracting from uh, the file system. So I'm starting from scratch from the archive itself. And then so making sure that I don't have any, 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 any uh, buffered output. And then I time the tar command and the dar command. And as you can see, the timings are very consistent. So for a 17 gigabytes file, extracting a file somewhere from the middle takes roughly 7.8 seconds, so 7.8 seconds with tar. And then at roughly 0.6 seconds, so less than a second, more than 10 times faster with DAR. So with DAR, what happens is it immediately, when you uh, request for a, request a file, it immediately goes to the index that is stored at the very end of the uh, DAR file. And then it knows at which a byte offset uh, to read that file. So extracting actually takes very little time. Whereas with TAR, what it does, so it does not scan the entire file. It starts scanning the TAR file and then it reads the first header. And then it knows that, okay, so this file, the very first in, uh, file in my TAR archive takes so many bytes. I have to, uh, to, uh, to jump a hat with this offset to the next header and then the next header and so on. So it has to read all headers until it encounters the file test 596 and that takes nearly eight seconds for a 17 gigabyte tar file. So in this case, you can see there, there are clearly benefits for, for using dar as opposed to tar. So now I'm gonna run a bunch of demos. So all demos in my presentation are divided into two categories. The first ones are manual demos. So in manual demos, I'll just run the command dar manually. And then uh, the function demos, I'll run some functions where you actually have, don't have to memorize all these flags and all these commands. But I'll start with the manual demos because it will give you the, uh, the full picture. So here what I did, I also created a uh, temporary directory. So inside NTMP directory, so I'm gonna show all demos on my laptop, but exactly the same demos work on, uh, on any Compute Canada clusters, uh, cluster as well, using either the system version of DAR, the older version, or the newer version that I mentioned that I compiled in my, in my home directory. So in this case, I'm creating a sli slightly, sm slightly smaller um, uh, test directory. So into the test directory, I'm also placing a thousand files called test then three digits from 000 to 999. And then I'm using a smaller scaling factor. So uh, sorry, uh, so smaller scaling factor and a smaller um, um, block size. So I'm writing in random numbers in blocks of eight bits. And so this results in a thousand files and these files are vary in size from eight kilobytes to uh, a quarter of a megabyte. So the total uh, uh, storage, well, the, the total amount of space taken by all these files inside the test directory is 134 megabytes. And so here I can show you, uh, this is my directory, 134 megabytes. These are the test files. And in fact, I can actually count these files. So I have a nice function count files. Essentially what it does, it just uh, run, uh, runs find on all the files inside of test and then counts how many lines I have in the output of, of find. So these count files um, uh, function are also included into that zip download that you can, uh, you can uh, see at the bottom of each slide. So here it says test has a thousand files. The total uh, size is 134 megabytes of all files combined. So let's just create a basic tar archive. So I'm gonna uh, type these commands from the slides. So I'm gonna see uh, dar minus w. So minus w dash w, it's a flag to uh, disable warning when you override. So I like to use it because sometimes I'll be in, in, in the other demos, I'll be overriding 
my previous uh, incremental backups. And so if you don't have minus W and you, have, you already have an archive with that name, it will simply give you a warning that, uh, well, it will prompt you whether you want to overwrite or not. So disable, to disable that warning, I just type minus W, then minus, v, minus C for uh, cre to create an archive. The archive is going to be, uh, is going to have the base name all. And then into that archive, I'm going to include everything from the test directory. So let's just run this command. And the command took about a second or two seconds. So you see that there were 1,001 inodes saved. So basically 1,000 files and plus the directory itself, the test directory. And then if we do ls minus l on the file, you see that it's 133 megabytes. So all original 1,000 files went in there. Uh, now the file, uh, the, the file name is all.1.da. And it actually consists of a base name. So these, these, um, uh, the, these things are important. So the base name is all. Later on, when we uh, create multiple backups, uh, uh, they will all have the same um, base name, uh, but uh, they will have different slice names. So uh, a slice name, well, actually, I'll explain it in, in the next few slides. So here's a base name called uh, all. Then uh, for that base, we have uh, the slice number. In this case, it's one, a single slice, and then the file extension. So the file name or the backup name is all.1.da. And then uh, let's restore it. So here I have an empty directory called restore, and I'm going to restore that backup into that file. So I'm going to say dar minus r restore. So minus r actually stands not for restore, but it stands for uh, using uh, restore as, uh, as a place to uh, restore our backup into. So we're going to restore into the directory that is currently empty. Then I'm going to say minus uh, capital O. What this slack does is uh, by uh, design DAO assumes that you're running it, you're storing as a super user, and then as a, when you run DAO as a super user to extract files from an archive, it will it will also set permissions according to the permissions stored in the DAO archive. And then because I'm not running it as a super user, it will actually give me a warning that uh, I cannot restore permissions. Uh, so and that only is important when you have permissions that do not belong to you, or files that don't belong to you, they will belong to some other users. So uh, because um, in most cases, actually, that's not, that's not the case. So I'm restoring uh, only my files in most cases. That warning is kind of useless. But to disable that warning, I'll just pass the capital minus O flag. Uh, so I don't see it any, anymore. Then minus W, overwrite. Uh, any, any previously created files, minus X for extract. So I'm going to extract from the archive with the base name all. And then I'm going to specify which file I want to extract. So I'm going to say it's test, uh, test 596, for example. Okay. And here we go. Two inodes restored. So it created a directory called test. And then there is a file uh, that we extracted and it all went into that restore directory. So now if you want to restore everything, what you do is you simply uh, specify the directory that you want to restore. So uh, DA, when you're restoring, DA does not accept wild masks, unfortunately. So you can either restore individual files, you have to specify them or individual directories, but you cannot specify wild masks. So this is one of the limitations of DA. Okay, so in this case, we're actually restoring all files and files. You see 1,001 inodes restored. And then if we go into restore test, you'll see there are 1,000 files in there. Uh, incremental backups, uh, as I mentioned, DAS supports incremental backups. And uh, let me show you uh, this to you. So uh, let me just start from the initial uh, setup. So I have a script alias clean that just brings everything back to uh, the original uh, state with nothing in backups and restore, and then 1,000 files in test. And then uh, let's uh, create an archive called Monday. So this is going to be exactly the same routine. So Monday, then minus G test. So Monday uh, backup is going to contain, is going to be the full backup of all files inside my test directory. OK, so 1,001 notes, uh, inodes saved. So there are all files were saved into this file Monday. Dot one dot da. And then uh, let's modify our directory a little bit. So I'm going to add a random file. Uh, so actually, instead of typing that command, I'll just uh, add an empty file. So let's say now on Tuesday, we are adding a new file into, into test. That is uh, just going to be an empty file in this case. So now there is a new file that we added. And now let's create an incremental backup. So an incremental backup is a backup where you don't do the full backup. 
uh, we already did the full backup on Monday. Uh, and now we're only back up, backing up those files that changed since Monday, right? So I added a new file and then uh, the new backup, incremental backup will actually contain only the, that new file. So I'm going to type dar minus w, so disable the warning, use Monday as a reference backup. So we're going to be creating an incremental backup uh, using Monday as a reference full backup and then uh, create a book backup called Tuesday. Tuesday. And then into that Tuesday, we're going to include everything from the test directory. So here we go. Two inodes saved, so a directory and a file were saved. And if you look at the file sizes of all these DAW backups, now you see we have a Monday backup and a Tuesday backup. And a Tuesday backup is a thousand times smaller than the Monday backup because Monday was a full backup. And on Tuesday, we just added a, a, another file and that file is, is very small. So the resulting incremental backup is, is very small. So now let's uh, add another, a couple of other files. So I'm going to call them Wednesday 1 and Wednesday 2. Oh, and actually I should move them into the test directory, right? So now inside test, we have uh, these two Wednesday files and also let's remove a file. So I'm going to remove, let's say, uh, test 999, okay? So now how many files do I have inside of test? We have 1,002 files. So we added one file on Tuesday, did an incremental backup, then we added two files on Wednesday, removed one file, and then now we're going to do an incremental backup. So for an incremental backup on Wednesday, I'm going to use Tuesday as a reference. I'm going to type here Tuesday. And then Wednesday is going to be the name of the new backup, new incremental backup, Wednesday. Okay, now let's take a look at all our backups and you see that the Wednesday backup is very small because essentially it only contains information from uh, those two new files plus a file delete. Now let's uh, try to list uh, the contents of uh, these, these backup files. So if I do dar minus l Monday, it will actually list everything inside uh, the full backup, right? So there's, there's going to be a thousand files, a lot of output. Now. Uh, let's search for, let's grab for a file test 999. It's there because that file we deleted on Wednesday, so it's still present in the full backup. Now let's see if it's on, it was in the incremental backup on Tuesday. It is there, it is included in backup, but actually the contents of the file test 999 is not in the Tuesday backup. It's only, it was because it was backed up on Monday, so it's included into the index on Tuesday, but it's actually content, content is, uh, was saved on Monday. Uh, let's try to see if it's present in the Wednesday backup. So I'll need to use a base name here. So dar minus L Wednesday and search for test 999. And it says that actually uh, it's there in the index, but it says removed entry. So that means that on Wednesday, we remove that file. So that if we're actually uh, doing the full restore and we start from Monday, then do Tuesday, then Wednesday. So the Wednesday restore is going to uh, delete that file, test 999, from, uh, from the restore directory. So let's try to do uh, some restoring. So let's see, yeah, the restore directory is currently empty. And let's actually restore the Wednesday backup only. So the Wednesday backup only has information from uh, the two files that we added on Wednesday, right? So once again, we have a full backup and then two incremental backups with much fa a smaller file sizes. So let's try to do restore into this restore directory. Uh, so minus capital O minus X Wednesday and see what happens. So it creates a directory test and it actually restored only those two files that were added on Wednesday. So the reason why it did not restore anything else because the Wednesday backup only has file contents of those two new files that were added on that day. So the stuff that I had on Monday and the stuff that I added on Tuesday is not part of that incremental backup. And that makes sense because incremental backup is much, much smaller than the full backup. So if we really want to restore everything, we need actually to go in, in sequence. So we have to restore everything from the Monday backup, then from Tuesday backup, and then from Wednesday backup. So we actually have to run the commands exactly as shown on the slide. So we have to do Monday re restore. So I'm also going to do minus W so that it doesn't warn me that uh, cast uh, directory was restored already. So this is full restore from Monday. Then we go we do full restore from, from Tuesday and then full restore from, from Wednesday. And then now in the restore directory, we have uh, 1,002 files. So let's count that. Uh, so in the restore directory, we have 1,002 files. And 
in the original directory, we have a thousand two files as well. So as you see, the restore actually uh, recreated my, my directory as of the Wednesday backup. So of course, if you want to restore the full backup, you just run the first command for the Monday full backup. Now, uh, there are lots and lots of options in DA, so I'm not going to talk about most of them, but a few useful uh, 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 workflows I'm going to mention. So let's say if you have a destination uh, file system that is small and you cannot, maybe you're writing to, I don't know, CD drives, well, CD ROMs, probably nobody is writing CD ROMs any longer, but maybe writing to a flash drive or to install a hard drive, and it's small, so you want to uh, limit the size of each backup. And in that case, you can simply specify the minus S the maximum size of a slice that you want to write into. So each slice is going to be a separate file, and then you'll have multiple separate files, and that's where your backup will be sitting. So let's back up into, let actually, let me uh, clean again everything. So we're starting with uh, nothing in backups and restore, and a 1,000 files in the original test directory. And then uh, let's limit the file size to 10 uh, megabytes. So uh, create a backup called Monday, and then we're backing up everything from the test directory. So in this case, the full test directory, a thousand files was backed up to a bunch of uh, files. And because uh, the full backup is roughly 133, 134 megabytes, and we limited the slice size to 10 megabytes, we ended up with uh, 14 individual files where the slice number reflects the uh, file, um, uh, well, the, the, uh, the, it's the slice number, so the, the file number. And then if we want to restore everything, all we need to do is type dar minus o minus x base name so you don't go through individual uh, slices and then it'll restore everything into so uh, yes override it and then as you see it, it warns me because I already had some files inside of actually no I don't have restore so oh because it's dealing with multiple files so I think what I need to do is c minus w and then it's not gonna gonna ask me for confirmation and then we restored all thousand files into oh actually sorry I'm restoring it. Yeah, the reason why I was complaining is because I, what I really want to do is restore into restore directory into this guy. Okay. And then we have a thousand files that were restored back into the restore directory. So let's see, do we have all the files in test? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, if you want to limit the number of files as opposed to the size of each slice, uh, in, in DA there's no such uh, flag, but what you can do, you can actually write your own script, and I already wrote a script called MultiDA. Actually, I wrote it probably about 10 years ago, and uh, uh, that script is actually inside a file called DAFunctions.sh, so that uh, zip download that I mentioned at the beginning, it contains the slides and also these DAFunctions.sh, so you can actually download to your own machine or to your uh, home folder on a cluster. And let me open that file with all the functions. So as you can see here, I have the count files function to which you can pass any number of, um, of directories in which you want to count files. And also here I have a multi dot function that does all, all the tricks. So how do you use it? Well, very easy. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to source uh, the the, DA, uh, the, the the file with all the functions. So that file on my machine is sitting inside documents, uh, sync HPC, DA functions folder. So now that multi DA is, is, um, is initialized, the function is initialized, and now I can use it. So what I'm going to type is multi DA, and you see it shows you, because we have not provided any flags, it gives you the uh, usage, the syntax that you should be using. So multi-da requires two arguments. One is the source directory that you're going you're gonna, to gonna be archiving, and the other one is maximum number of files. Per, actually, it's not per archive, per slice. I should change that. So it's going to create, actually, no, sorry, per archive. Yes, correct. Maximum number of files per archive. So we have a 1,000 files inside of test, and uh, let's just uh, limit uh, the number of files per archive to, let's say, 300. So I'm going to say uh, multi-da, compress the, everything in the test directory, and with a maximum of 300 files per archive. And what it does, it creates four archives, so 1,000 files, maximum of 300 files per archive. So we end up with um, three large archives and one smaller one. Uh, that contains our that contain our original thousand files. So to extract them, you actually have to go through them individually. Or what you have to do is type da minus r. Uh, we're storing into the restore directory minus o minus uh, w minus x, and then 
on the first file, task dash 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 AAA, and then restore this guy, then restore the second guy, and so on. So uh, I restored only two files, uh, sorry, two archives, and that gives me six, 600 files, then you have 900 and 1,000 files. And of course, if you want to automate that, you can simply use the standard bash for loop, and so in this case, I'm going through all task dash AA files, and then uh, the last letter runs from A to D, and then just restoring the full backup. So this is just to show you how you can limit the number of files per each DAR archive. Okay, uh, the most useful, in my opinion, function is the backup function that I have in this uh, in the same file right here. And it's a more complex function, so let's just uh, take a couple of minutes and, and see what it does, and then we'll, uh, we'll try to run it. Uh, so backup is, uh, is doing a backup. You are backing everything, uh, not everything, sorry, you're backing, you're backing uh, things inside, in, in this case, inside my TMP uh, directory in my home folder on my laptop. So again, I'm going to run this demo on my laptop, but this demo, if you change this to your home directory on, on a cluster, uh, then uh, this, demo, th this function should work on the cluster as well. So here I'm backing up stuff in, inside the TMP folder on, on, on my laptop. And then uh, this is uh, the backup source. This is what I'm going to backup. And then uh, the backup is going to go into the backups uh, directory. And then uh, individuals, uh, uh, so the base name is going to be all. So btag is simply the base name. So the files are going to be all.1.da and all.2.da and so on. And these are the flags I'm going to use. So I limit the maximum size of each uh, archive to five gigabytes, of each slice to five gigabytes. Then I'm going to use uh, compression. So I'm going to use more efficient uh, bzip2 compression, more efficient than zip and then gzip. Uh, so this refers to permissions. Uh, uh, so if you, if you want about this option, uh, then you can look up the manual page of that and you see what it does exactly. Uh, then disable warnings when overriding, and then uh, exclude these files. So let's say all files with the tilde at the end and the object files are going to be excluded from backup. Do not use encryption. In the very last demo, I will turn on encryption, but for now, don't use it. And then you have a bunch of if statements. So essentially, what it does, it, um, it uh, actually, let me show you uh, the example. So uh, let me clean everything, start from the same initial state, uh, state, nothing in backups, nothing in restore, and then test has a thousand files, and then I simply run backup. If you don't provide any flags, it will just complain, it will say you have a missing argument, you need to supply an argument, and an argument has to be either show or one of the integer numbers from 0 to 99. Uh, so let's do a backup show. Backup show will actually show you currently existing backups because we haven't backed up anything yet. It will simply say there are no files, right? But in principle, after you create a backup, it will show you uh, the, uh, well, your archive, the backup files. Uh, now let's create the first backup. So the first backup is um, you create uh, by simply saying backup zero, and that will create a full backup. So the backup, once again, will go into my backups folder, and it will backup everything from the test folder. Okay, so I'm doing the full backup, and it goes into backups directory. So that should take a few seconds. Now it's slower because we're using compression. We turn on the compression, so it's actually compressing all the files as well. And because uh, those files contain random bits, uh, it's very hard to compress them. So the end uh, result will be almost the same file size. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the resulting output is 134 megabytes. Actually, yeah, compression didn't work because uh, initially we had random, entirely random bits. And uh, we created a backup called all 0.1.da. So now let's try to uh, check our backup. So I type backup show, and it shows me that currently I have a single uh, backup, so it's a full backup, all, all zero. Uh, single slice, and it's 134 megabytes large. So now let's do some uh, changes to make some changes in our directory. So I'll just add another file. I'll just type some random stuff. So it's a random file name that I added to my test directory. And then I'm going to create the first incremental backup. So the first incremental backup is going to be using uh, backup zero as a reference, the full backup as a reference. So we'll do backup one. And it worked because I added a, a very small, well, zero size a file. Backup took only a fraction of a second. And you see that my first incremental backup is actually much smaller than my full backup, which makes sense. Uh, let's make some other change. So I'll add another file, just some other random stuff. And then uh, let's make another incremental backup. So the next incremental backup is done with backup two. 
then I can do backup three and so on. So in this case, I have, I did, I ran backup zero, backup one, backup two, backup three. I have a full backup and then three incremental backups. So now what I can do is uh, if I want, I can actually continue going so I can do backup four, backup five and so on. And this function will actually work up to 99. And then every time I want to check these backups, I simply do backup show. But eventually you probably end up with a lot of files and uh, you don't need to uh, do an incremental backup every time. What you can do, you can actually go back in numbers and override one of the previously existing backups. So for example, if I type backup one, it will actually override the first incremental backup. It will override all one, and then it will raise incremental backups two and three. So these actually erased backups two and three and overrode the first incremental backups. And then I can continue going up. So backup th two, backup three, backup four, and so on. And then if I wanna override, let's say start from two, I'll go back to backup two. And now this is still my full backup as of now. Uh, and uh, so the very first initial full backup was all zero. And then now I have two incremental backups, one and two. Uh, so this is actually a very nice uh, system to uh, do uh, large backups uh, to a much smaller file system. So for example, what I do, I use this script all the time every day uh, on my laptop and my laptop has a very large internal drive and a much smaller, so I do backups to a much smaller flash, a flash drive. So the flash drive is only a small fraction of the size of the built-in drive on my laptop. Uh, so the flash drive is only 32 gigabytes in size, but because I can, uh, so I can do a full backup and then all zero, and then I store this full backup on some other external hard drive. And maybe I can probably, uh, just to make sure that it's not, not lost, I stored, uh, store exactly the same copy of the full backup all zero on several external hard drives. And then uh, to, on the same external hard drive, I create the first incremental backup all one and then I copy that incremental backup to a flash drive, and then I use a flash drive as a destination drive. And now, because uh, all one, my first incremental backup that is much smaller than the full backup, uh, it contains uh, the full index of my uh, backed up directory. I can actually, I don't actually need the full backup to, uh, to uh, do incremental backup backups anymore. And this is really nice because uh, you are, unless you're making some very large file systems on your uh, file system changes on your laptop, let's say you're making also, uh, you know, multi gigabyte data files or movies, etc. cetera. Uh, it's almost guaranteed that you will not run you will not run out of disk space on the destination flash drive for quite a while. And then if you, when you run out of space, what you can do, you can or any, at any time go back to the original external hard drive that is much bigger, that contains the full backup, and then do another first incremental backup, then copy that incremental backup to the destination uh, flash drive, and then start from scratch, start doing these incremental backups. And in this case, again, you need a much, much smaller uh, flash drive to essentially do full backups of your entire laptop uh, without pay paying a lot of money to buy you know, a much bigger external SSD. So how do you restore these backups? Well, there is a restore function. Uh, that is the last function in this file. And uh, let, let me just run it. So as other functions in, in this file, when you just type restore, it will simply complain. It will show you how you should use it, the syntax. And there are a bunch of flags you can pass to restore. For example, you can say restore minus L and then any pattern. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, da does not accept Unix wild masks. So when you're storing stuff, you have to either supply a full uh, file name a full directory name or a list of such files and directories that you, you're gonna restore. Uh, so, but fortunately with restore minus L because underneath it just does grab, it just looks for a pattern. So with restore, you can actually, you can actually uh, pass a, uh, a, uh, a, a, any pattern, so any number of characters and it'll just looking for these characters in the output of restore minus L. So let's say I'm wondering about a file called, called uh, test 99 in my backup and uh, it says that, okay, so here I had several slices. I had, uh, let's see how many, I had all zero, all one and all two. Actually, let's show these slices. So I had three backups, a first ba uh, the, the full backup and then two incremental backups. And the file test 999 shows in indexes in, uh, of, of these three backups. Now to restore it, what I can do is, well, I can do something like this, restore minus, let's say, go 
use the latest version minus N2 and then um, do test test 999. So this will actually not work. So it says why I not restored. So it restored the directory, but not the file. And you see that it did not restore the file. And the reason for this is because I asked to restore the file from the second or the latest incremental backup. And that latest incremental backup does not have the file contents of the file. So uh, what I can do is I can uh, do restore minus L on the file again, and I can see where it first appears in, in my backups. And what I want to do is I probably want to go back to the original backup. Uh, well, the first backup where that file shows up, then extract that backup and then go through all, uh, all other incremental backups. So, uh, Basically, I need to run these, these commands. So I'm going to say restore minus n0 on this file, then restore minus n1 on this file, and so on. Fortunately, you don't need to do that because restore function handles all of that for you. So all you do is type restore minus x test test 999, and it will simply restore, all the, uh, re restore this file going through all uh, backup sequentially. So here we go, and then and then we check and, and it was, 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 was restored. So as I mentioned, DA does not understand wild mass. That's why you need to specify a full, uh, either a full, uh, well, basically a full path. So a full um, file name or a full directory name when you're restoring things. Okay, so uh, last example is encryption. You can actually add encryption uh, to your backups, you can encrypt your backups, and uh, this is very easy to do. All you need to do is pass the uh, this flag. So I will uncomment this line. Minus K A E S will use the uh, the uh, strong encryption, and then I'm going to source this uh, this um, file again so that I have the new version of backup with encryption turned on. So uh, let me clean things again. Okay, so TAS has 2002 files. Well, fine. And then I'm going to source uh, the DA functions uh, script. So now I have the backup function with encryption turned on. And then I simply say backup. Uh, let's start from the zeroth backup, backup zero, 00. And now it asks for a password. So I'll supply some password. I'll need to confirm it. And then it's actually creating a full backup now. And um, it's uh, compressing it and also encrypting it. So uh, DA supports both a symmetric and asymmetric PGP style uh, passwords. So in this case, I'm using a simple symmetric password. But in principle, you can also use keys, so things like a public key and a private key, and, and that will be supported as well. So here it created a, a backup. Now, if I want to restore it, uh, what I do is restore minus, uh, actually, let me restore it using DA. So I'm going to say DA minus, uh, minus extract on all zero. And it says, okay, yeah, minus O, so confirm. Oops, sorry. Escape. It's complaining because uh, it's, rest it's try tried to restore a lot of files, and then I didn't specify these flags. So for each file, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna ask me. Oh, duh, no. Oh, let me try this. Escape. Return yes. Backup file is present. Oh yes, that is because because my backup is actually sitting not in this directory because I use the backup script, but it's is sitting inside the backup directory. So let me escape. It's actually sitting not in this directory, but inside the backup directory. That's why it's complaining. So let me point to it. All zero. Okay, and now it asks for a password. So if I supply a wrong password, it gives me fatal error. But if I supply the right password, it actually works. So now it is extracting things into, into the, um, yeah, actually into the current directory. Okay, done. And here's my, so if I go into Actually, it restored into the same directory, but it worked. Right? So the point here is that you can use encryption. Unfortunately, uh, when you have multiple uh, archives, so for example, you're doing a full backup and then the first backup, each one of them will use a, a separate password. 
and uh, then you'll have to type a password multiple times. So because let's say you created a full backup that was encrypted. So when you were doing this, you type the password uh, twice. So to well, the password itself and confirmation. And now let's say you are doing the first incremental backup. So you're typing backup one, and then it will ask you for a password first to decrypt the reference full backup, uh, then the password uh, for the new incremental backup, and then confirm that new incremental backup password. So it will ask for a password three times. And unfortunately, there is no easy way to script uh, that, uh, that interaction. Uh, well, no, yeah, no secure way to script it. So you will have to enter password three times when you do the incremental backup. But I think it's a fairly small price to pay for secure backup, if, especially if you're working on, on a shared file system. So uh, finally, the summary slide, uh, DAR has lots and lots of nice features. So all the scripts that I showed you today, of course, they assume that, uh, well, exercise common sense. So they assume some things. So they assume that when you're creating a backup, for example, you have right access to the backup that you are below your quota. Because if you uh, have reached your quota, either uh, the total disk storage in the, in the file system or the number of, you exceed the number of files, maximum allowed number of files, then you're no longer allowed to write under that file system. So obviously those scripts won't work because uh, your destination file system is full and you cannot create any backups. So things like that, whenever you, uh, you do any backups, whenever you use DAR to create um, archives, make sure that it actually works. And uh, what I find very useful is whenever you run a backup, so that backup utility, it actually shows you, okay, so need the password. When you run it, it actually outputs uh, the names of the backups along the, with their file sizes. And these guys I find really, really useful because it really shows you how much stuff um, have changed in your directory that you're backing up compared to the previous backup. So in this case, I see that I had a full backup and then I had very little, made very little change in my, in my folder. So the backup size is very small. So the opposite, if the opposite is true, you are adding a lot of files, uh, then your incremental backup should be, should be large. So things like that, please always pay attention to them. Please always make sure that you, uh, you actually write into, into, into the DAR archive that your, your backup is valid uh, before deleting the original files that you're trying to backup. So um, I think I will stop here.